Section seven of Tales of the Fish Patrol by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section seven. Yellow Handkerchief. I'm not wanting to dictate to you, lad, Charlie said, but I'm very much against your making a last raid. You've gone safely through rough times with rough men, and it would be a shame to have something happen to you at the very end. "'But how can I get out of making a last raid?' I demanded, with the cocksureness of youth. "'There always has to be a last, you know, to anything.' Charlie crossed his legs, leaned back, and considered the problem. "'Very true. But why not call the capture of Demetrios Contos the last? You're back from it safe and sound and hearty for all your good wedding, and—and—' and... His voice broke, and he could not speak for a moment. "'And I could never forgive myself if anything happened to you now.' i laughed at charlie's fears while i gave in to the claims of his affection and agreed to consider the last raid already performed we had been together for two years and now i was leaving the fish patrol in order to go back and finish my education i had earned and saved money to put me through three years at the high school and though the beginning of the term was several months away i intended doing a lot of studying for the entrance examination my belongings were packed snugly in a sea-chest, and I was all ready to buy my ticket and ride down on the train to Oakland, when Neil Partington arrived in Benicia. The reindeer was needed immediately for work far down on the lower bay, and Neil said he intended to run straight for Oakland. As that was his home, and I was to live with his family while going to school, he saw no reason, he said, why I should not put my chest aboard and come along. So the chest went aboard, and in the middle of the afternoon we hoisted the reindeer's big mainsail and cast off. It was tantalizing fall weather. The sea breeze, which had blown steadily all summer, was gone, and in its place were capricious winds and murky skies which made the time of arriving anywhere extremely problematical. We started on the first of the ebb, and as we slipped down the Carcanez Straits, I looked my last for some time upon Benicia and the bite at Turner's shipyard where we had besieged the Lancashire Queen, and had captured Big Alec, the King of the Greeks. And at the mouth of the Straits I looked with not a little interest upon the spot where a few days before I should have drowned, but for the good that was in the nature of Demetrios Contos. A great wall of fog advanced across San Pablo Bay to meet us and in a few minutes the reindeer was running blindly through the damp obscurity. Charlie, who was steering, seemed to have an instinct for that kind of work. How he did it, he himself confessed that he did not know, but he had a way of calculating winds, currents, distance, time, drift, and sailing speed that was truly marvelous. "'It looks as though it were lifting,' Neil Partington said a couple of hours after we had entered the fog. "'Where do you say we are, Charlie?' Charlie looked at his watch. Six o'clock and three hours more of ebb, he remarked casually. But where do you say we are? Neil insisted. Charlie pondered a moment and then answered. The tide has edged us over a bit out of our course, but if the fog lifts right now, as it is going to lift, you'll find we're not more than a thousand miles off McNear's Landing. You might be a little more definite by a few miles, anyway, Neil grumbled, showing by his tone that he disagreed. All right, then, Charlie said conclusively, not less than a quarter of a mile, not more than a half. The wind freshened with a couple of little puffs, and the fog thinned perceptibly. McNear's is right off there, Charlie said, pointing directly into the fog on our weather beam. The three of us were peering intently in that direction when the reindeer struck with a dull crash and came to a standstill. We ran forward and found her bowsprit entangled in the tanned rigging of a short, chunky mast. She had collided head-on with a Chinese junk lying at anchor. At the moment we arrived forward, five Chinese, like so many bees, came swarming out of the little tween-decks cabin, the sleep still in their eyes. Leading them came a big, muscular man, conspicuous for his pockmarked face and the yellow silk handkerchief swathed about his head. It was Yellow Handkerchief, the Chinaman whom we had arrested for illegal shrimp fishing the year before, and who at that time had nearly sunk the reindeer as he had nearly sunk it now by violating the rules of navigation. "'What do you mean, you yellow-faced heathen, lying here in a fairway without a horn a-going?' Charlie cried hotly. 
mean neil calmly answered just take a look that's what he means our eyes followed the direction indicated by neil's finger and we saw the open amidships of the junk half filled as we found on closer examination with fresh caught shrimps mingled with the shrimps were myriads of small fish from a quarter of an inch upwards in size yellow handkerchief had lifted the trap net at high water slack and taking advantage of the concealment offered by the fog had boldly been lying by waiting to lift the net again at low water slack well neil hummed and hawed in all my varied and extensive experience as a fish patrolman i must say this is the easiest capture i ever made what'll we do with them charlie tow the junk into san rafael of course came the answer charlie turned to me you stand by the junk lad and i'll pass you a towing line if the wind doesn't fail us we'll make the creek before the tide gets too low sleep at san rafael and arrive in oakland tomorrow by midday so saying charlie and neil returned to the reindeer and got under way the junk towing astern i went aft and took charge of the prize steering by means of an antiquated tiller and a rudder with large diamond-shaped holes through which the water rushed back and forth by now the last of the fog had vanished and charlie's estimate of our position was confirmed by the sight of mcnear's landing a short half mile away following along the west shore we rounded point pedro in plain view of the chinese shrimp villages and a great to-do was raised when they saw one of their junks towing behind the familiar fish patrol sloop the wind coming off the land was rather puffy and uncertain and it would have been more to our advantage had it been stronger san rafael creek up which we had to go to reach the town and turn over our prisoners to the authorities ran through wide stretching marshes and was difficult to navigate on a falling tide while at low tide it was impossible to navigate at all so with the tide already half ebbed it was necessary for us to make time this the heavy junk prevented lumbering along behind and holding the reindeer back by just so much dead weight tell those coolies to get up that sail charlie finally called to me we don't want to hang up on the mud flats for the rest of the night i repeated the order to yellow handkerchief who mumbled it huskily to his men he was suffering from a bad cold which doubled him up in convulsive coughing spells and made his eyes heavy and bloodshot this made him more evil-looking than ever and when he glanced viciously at me i remembered with a shiver the close shave i had had with him at the time of his previous arrest his crew sullenly tailed on to the halyards and the strange outlandish sail lateen in rig and dyed a warm brown rose in the air we were sailing on the wind and when yellow handkerchief flattened down the sheet the junk forged ahead and the tow-line went slack fast as the reindeer could sail the junk outsailed her and to avoid running her down i hauled a little closer on the wind but the junk likewise outpointed and in a couple of minutes i was abreast of the reindeer and to windward the tow-line had now tautened at right angles to the two boats and the predicament was laughable cast off i shouted charlie hesitated it's all right i added nothing can happen we'll make the creek on this tack and you'll be right behind me all the way up to san rafael at this charlie cast off and yellow handkerchief sent one of his men forward to haul in the line in the gathering darkness i could just make out the mouth of san rafael creek and by the time we entered it i could barely see its banks the reindeer was fully five minutes astern and we continued to leave her astern as we beat up the narrow winding channel with charlie behind us it seemed i had little to fear from my five prisoners but the darkness prevented my keeping a sharp eye on them so i transferred my revolver from my trousers pocket to the side pocket of my coat where i could more quickly put my hand on it yellow handkerchief was the one i feared and that he knew it and made use of it subsequent events will show he was sitting a few feet away from me on what then happened to be the weather side of the junk i could scarcely see the outlines of his form but i soon became convinced that he was slowly very slowly edging closer to me i watched him carefully steering with my left hand i slipped my right into my pocket and got hold of the revolver i saw him shift along for a couple of inches and i was just about to order him back the words were trembling on the tip of my tongue when i was struck with great force by a heavy figure that leaped through the air upon me from the lee side it was one of the crew he pinioned my right arm so that i could not withdraw my hand from my pocket and at the same time clapped his other hand over my mouth 
of course i could have struggled away from him and freed my hand or gotten my mouth clear so that i might cry in an alarm but in a trice yellow handkerchief was on top of me i struggled around to no purpose in the bottom of the junk while my legs and arms were tied and my mouth securely bound in what i afterward found out to be a cotton shirt then i was left lying in the bottom yellow handkerchief took the tiller issuing his orders in whispers and from our position at the time and from the alteration of the sail which i could dimly make out above me as a blot against the stars i knew the junk was being headed into the mouth of a small slough which emptied at the point into san rafael creek in a couple of minutes we ran softly alongside the bank and the sail was silently lowered the chinese kept very quiet yellow handkerchief sat down in the bottom alongside of me and i could feel him straining to repress his raspy hacking cough possibly seven or eight minutes later i heard charlie's voice as the reindeer went past the mouth of the slough i can't tell you how relieved i am i could plainly hear him saying to neil that the lad has finished with the fish patrol without accident here neil said something which i could not catch and then charlie's voice went on the youngster takes naturally to the water and if when he finishes high school he takes a course in navigation and goes deep sea i see no reason why he shouldn't rise to be master of the finest and biggest ship afloat it was all very flattering to me but lying there bound and gagged by my own prisoners with the voices growing faint and fainter as the reindeer slipped on through the darkness toward san rafael i must say i was not in quite the proper situation to enjoy my smiling future with the reindeer went my last hope what was to happen next i could not imagine for the chinese were a different race from mine and from what i knew i was confident that fair play was no part of their make-up after waiting a few minutes longer the crew hoisted the lateen sail and yellow handkerchief steered down toward the mouth of san rafael creek the tide was getting lower and he had difficulty in escaping the mud-flats i was hoping he would run aground but he succeeded in making the bay without accident as we passed out of the creek a noisy discussion arose which i knew related to me yellow handkerchief was vehement but the other four as vehemently opposed him it was very evident that he advocated doing away with me and they were afraid of the consequences i was familiar enough with the chinese character to know that fear alone restrained them but what plan they offered in place of yellow handkerchief's murderous one i could not make out my feelings as my fate hung in the balance may be guessed the discussion developed into a quarrel in the midst of which yellow handkerchief unshipped the heavy tiller and sprang toward me but his four companions threw themselves between and a clumsy struggle took place for possession of the tiller in the end yellow handkerchief was overcome and sullenly returned to the steering while they soundly berated him for his rashness not long after the sail was run down and the junk slowly urged forward by means of the sweeps i felt it ground gently on the soft mud three of the chinese they all wore long sea boots got over the side and the other two passed me across the rail with yellow handkerchief at my legs and his two companions at my shoulders they began to flounder along through the mud after some time their feet struck firmer footing and i knew they were carrying me up some beach the location of this beach was not doubtful in my mind it could be none other than one of the marin islands a group of rocky islets which lay off the marin county shore when they reached the firm sand that marked high tide i was dropped and none too gently yellow handkerchief kicked me spitefully in the ribs and then the two floundered back through the mud to the junk a moment later i heard the sail go up and slat in the wind as they drew in the sheet then silence fell and i was left to my own devices for getting free i remembered having seen tricksters writhe and squirm out of ropes with which they were bound but though i writhed and squirmed like a good fellow the knots remained as hard as ever and there was no appreciable slack in the course of my squirming however i rolled over upon a heap of clam shells the remains evidently of some yachting party's clam bake this gave me an idea my hands were tied behind my back and clutching a shell in them i rolled over and over up the beach till i came to the rocks i knew to be there rolling about and searching i finally discovered a narrow crevice into which i shoved the shell the edge of it was sharp and across the sharp edge i proceeded to saw the rope that bound my wrists the edge of the shell was also brittle and i broke it by bearing too heavily upon it then i rolled back to the heap and returned with as many shells as i could carry in both hands 
i broke many shells cut my hands a number of times and got cramps in my legs from my strained position and my exertions yet while i was suffering from the cramps and resting i heard the familiar halloo drift across the water it was charlie searching for me the gag in my mouth prevented me from replying and i could only lie there helplessly fuming while he rowed past the island and his voice slowly lost itself in the distance i returned to the sawing process and at the end of half an hour succeeded in severing the rope the rest was easy my hands once free it was a matter of minutes to loosen my legs and to take the gag out of my mouth i ran around the island to make sure it was an island and not by chance a portion of the mainland an island it certainly was one of the marin group fringed with a sandy beach and surrounded by a sea of mud nothing remained but to wait till daylight and to keep warm for it was a cold raw night for california with just enough wind to pierce the skin and cause one to shiver to keep up the circulation i ran around the island a dozen times or so and clambered across its rocky backbone as many times more all of which was of greater service to me as i afterward discovered than merely to warm me up in the midst of this exercise i wondered if i had lost anything out of my pockets while rolling over and over in the sand a search showed the absence of my revolver and pocket knife the first yellow handkerchief had taken but the knife had been lost in the sand i was hunting for it when the sound of rowlocks came to my ears at first of course i thought of charlie but on second thought i knew charlie would be calling out as he rode along a sudden premonition of danger seized me the marin islands were lonely places chance visitors in the dead of night are hardly to be expected what if it were yellow handkerchief the sound made by the rowlocks grew more distinct i crouched in the sand and listened intently the boat which i judged a small skiff from the quick stroke of the oars was landing in the mud about fifty yards up the beach i heard a raspy hacking cough and my heart stood still it was yellow handkerchief not to be robbed of his revenge by his more cautious companions he had stolen away from the village and come back alone i did some swift thinking i was unarmed and helpless on a tiny islet and a yellow barbarian whom i had reason to fear was coming after me any place was safer than the island and i turned immediately to the water or rather to the mud as he began to flounder ashore through the mud i started to flounder out into it going over the same course which the chinese had taken in landing me and in returning to the junk yellow handkerchief believing me to be lying tightly bound exercised no care but came ashore noisily this helped me for under the shield of his noise and making no more myself than necessary i managed to cover fifty feet by the time he had made the beach here i lay down in the mud it was cold and clammy and made me shiver but i did not care to stand up and run the risk of being discovered by his sharp eyes he walked down the beach straight to where he had left me lying and i had a fleeting feeling of regret at not being able to see his surprise when he did not find me but it was a very fleeting regret for my teeth were chattering with the cold what his movements were after that i had largely to deduce from the facts of the situation for i could scarcely see him in the dim starlight but i was sure that the first thing he did was to make the circuit of the beach to learn if landings had been made by other boats this he would have known at once by the tracks through the mud convinced that no boat had removed me from the island he next started to find out what had become of me beginning at the pile of clamshells he lighted matches to trace my tracks in the sand at such times i could see his villainous face plainly and when the sulphur from the matches irritated his lungs between the raspy cough that followed and the clammy mud in which i was lying i confess i shivered harder than ever the multiplicity of my footprints puzzled him then the idea that i might be out in the mud must have struck him for he waded out a few yards in my direction and stooping with his eyes searched the dim surface long and carefully he could not have been more than fifteen feet from me and had he lighted a match he would surely have discovered me he returned to the beach and clambered about over the rocky backbone again hunting for me with lighted matches the closeness of the shore impelled me to further flight not daring to wade upright on account of the noise made by floundering and by the suck of the mud 
i remained lying down in the mud and propelled myself over its surface by means of my hands still keeping the trail made by the chinese in going from and to the junk i held on until i had reached the water into this i waded to a depth of three feet and then i turned off to the side in a line parallel with the beach the thought came to me of going toward yellow handkerchief's skiff and escaping in it but at that very moment he returned to the beach and as though fearing the very thing i had in mind he slushed out through the mud to assure himself that the skiff was safe this turned me in the opposite direction half swimming half wading with my head just out of water and avoiding splashing i succeeded in putting about a hundred feet between myself and the spot ashore where the chinese had begun to wade ashore from the junk i drew myself out on the mud and remained lying flat again yellow handkerchief returned to the beach and made a search of the island and again he returned to the heap of clamshells i knew what was running in his mind as well as he did himself no one could leave or land without making tracks in the mud the only tracks to be seen were those leading from his skiff and from where the junk had been i was not on the island i must have left it by one or other of those two tracks he had just been over the one to his skiff and was certain i had not left that way therefore i could have left the island only by going over the tracks of the junk landing this he proceeded to verify by wading out over them himself lighting matches as he came along when he arrived at the point where i had first lain i knew by the matches he burned and the time he took that he had discovered the marks left by my body these he followed straight to the water and into it but in three feet of water he could no longer see them on the other hand as the tide was still falling he could easily make out the impression made by the junk's bow and could have likewise made out the impression of any other boat if it had landed at that particular spot but there was no such mark and i knew that he was absolutely convinced that i was hiding somewhere in the mud but to hunt on a dark night for a boy in a sea of mud would be like hunting for a needle in a haystack and he did not attempt it instead he went back to the beach and prowled around for some time i was hoping he would give up and go for by this time i was suffering severely from the cold at last he waded out to his skiff and rowed away what if this departure of yellow handkerchiefs were a sham what if he had done it merely to entice me ashore the more i thought of it the more certain i became that he had made a little too much noise with his oars as he rowed away so i remained lying in the mud and shivering i shivered till the muscles of the small of my back ached and pained me as badly as the cold and i had need of all my self-control to force myself to remain in my miserable situation it was well that i did however for possibly an hour later i thought i could make out something moving on the beach i watched intently but my ears were rewarded first by a raspy cough i knew only too well yellow handkerchief had sneaked back landed on the other side of the island and crept around to surprise me if i had returned after that though hours passed without sign of him i was afraid to return to the island at all on the other hand i was equally afraid that i should die of the exposure i was undergoing i had never dreamed one could suffer so i grew so cold and numb finally that i ceased to shiver but my muscles and bones began to ache in a way that was agony the tide had long since begun to rise and foot by foot it drove me in toward the beach high water came at three o'clock and at three o'clock i drew myself up on the beach more dead than alive and too helpless to have offered any resistance had yellow handkerchief swooped down upon me but no yellow handkerchief appeared he had given up and gone back to point pedro nevertheless i was in a deplorable not to say a dangerous condition i could not stand upon my feet much less walk my clammy muddy garments clung to me like sheets of ice i thought i should never get them off so numb and lifeless were my fingers and so weak was i that it seemed to take an hour to get off my shoes i had not the strength to break the porpoise hide laces and the knots defied me i repeatedly beat my hands upon the rocks to get some sort of life into them sometimes i felt sure i was going to die but in the end after several centuries it seemed to me i got off the last of my clothes the water was now close at hand and i crawled painfully into it and washed the mud from my naked body still i could not get on my feet and walk and i was afraid to lie still nothing remained but to crawl weakly like a snail and at the cost of constant pain up and down the island 
i kept this up as long as possible but as the east paled with the coming of the dawn i began to succumb the sky grew rosy red and the golden rim of the sun showing above the horizon found me lying helpless and motionless among the clamshells as in a dream i saw the familiar mainsail of the reindeer as she slipped out of san rafael creek on a light puff of morning air this dream was very much broken there are intervals i can never recollect on looking back over it three things however i distinctly remember the first sight of the reindeer's mainsail her lying at anchor a few hundred feet away and a small boat leaving her side and the cabin stove roaring red-hot myself swathed all over with blankets except on the chest and shoulders which charlie was pounding and mauling unmercifully and my mouth and throat burning with the coffee which neil partington was pouring down a trifle too hot but burn or no burn i tell you it felt good by the time we arrived in oakland i was as limber and strong as ever though charlie and neil partington were afraid i was going to have pneumonia and mrs partington for my first six months of school kept an anxious eye upon me to discover the first symptoms of consumption time flies it seems but yesterday that i was a lad of sixteen on the fish patrol yet i know that i arrived this very morning from china with a quick passage to my credit and master of the barkentine harvester and i know that to-morrow morning i shall run over to oakland to see neil partington and his wife and family and later on up to benicia to see charlie le grant and talk over old times no i shall not go to benicia now that i think about it i expect to be a highly interested party to a wedding shortly to take place her name is alice partington and since charlie has promised to be best man he will have to come down to oakland instead End of section seven. End of Tales of the Fish Patrol by Jack London. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com.